Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Colby. I'm director of the Intelligence Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today uh, to introduce a session, discussion, series of questions and answers on open source intelligence and the art of the possible. There was once a time when intelligence collection was the purview of governments, which had vast apparatuses and organizations devoted to collection of intelligence with human, salient technical means, uh, using exquisite and expensive resources, uh, with large analytic components toiling away to analyze that information collected in great secrecy and often at great risk. Uh, and then a system that was cloistered and sequestered that restricted information, that compartmented it, that stamped things eyes only and restricted handling and made sure that as few people could see it as possible, the precious sources and methods which were being used to collect and analyze that intelligence. Wasn't that long ago. Today, however, the situation is completely different. You have every one of us, 8 billion people around the world, generating every day vast troves of data exhaust. Organizations which have meticulous record keeping, have, uh, are assiduously collecting every bit of data they can of business analytics, of customer analytics to understand what's happening, to be able to, in some cases, to help their populations, in some cases, to control their populations, uh, part of governments. Most of this information is openly accessible in one way or another. Vast troves of data uh, that, if analyzed and purposed, can provide stunning insights into areas that were previously only discoverable through risky, expensive, and restricted intelligence collection methods through governments. Today, we want to talk a little bit about how this field is developing and how the industry is developing many different companies out there that are purposing this in one way or another, figuring out how to collect, how to analyze, how to use, how to apply different sets of tools to this, uh, both to help governments, but also to help business, media, NGOs, just about any application that you can think of where decisions need to be made that intelligence can help. So with that, I'm going to turn the discussion over to my colleague, Maria Robson Morrow. Uh, program manager at the intelligence project here and my friend, former colleague and Belfer fellow, Kristen Wood, CEO of Chris Mill Exchange. Ria, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. And I want to echo Paul's welcome to everyone for joining us today for open source intelligence for national security, the art of the possible. We're very excited for the panelists we have lined up, whom my colleague Crystal will shortly introduce to you. Uh, but first, we did have a few administrative notes. So thank you again to those of you who are joining. We have well over 100 participants in Kaolting. It's getting close to 150 already. So uh, we're delighted you all could join us today. And uh, we wanted to note that while this virtual event is on the record, the Belfer Center does prohibit any attendees, including journalists, from audiovisual recording or distributing parts or all of the event program without authorization or permission from participants today. Uh, and so thank you for observing that. But the session is on the record. As attendees, your cameras and microphones have been muted for the session, but we encourage you to post questions that you have for the panelists in the Q&A box, and we will get to as many of them at the end as we can. We'll hear from each of our speakers, and then we'll move to Q&A. So as Paul mentioned, we are very excited to hear from a cross-section of organizations today that are dealing with this wealth of information that's available, uh, not on the high side, uh, available without classification and same restrictions that we've seen historically in intelligence. And uh, I know that on this call as attendees, we have a cross section of those of you, uh, some of whom are in the private sector, some are in academia, some are in government who are wrestling with these questions of how to best leverage this vast array, uh, this embarrassment of riches of information that we have available. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the microphone over to Kristen, who will introduce our speakers who are going to shed some light on that. Kristen, over to you. Maria, thank you so much. It is an honor to be here today. And Maria and Paul and I have been working on this for a better part of a year to pull together a uh, 
group of companies that are doing really, really interesting work in the spaces in which they offer, offer they operate. So several of them are nonprofits dealing with some of the most difficult problems that we face as a nation, as a, at the world. Some of them are doing work that's strictly for um, commercial enterprises, and some of them have a hybrid where they do some work for government. So um, what we wanted to do today was to address a variety of topics that are really this mix of uh, commercial companies doing work for their own purposes to support um, people in need, to support other companies and businesses to to raise money. Um, and um, what can be done that also works for national security um, for uh, the West? And we are definitely seeing um, nation state level attacks, not just inside government anymore, but that's being faced in the private sector. And there's companies that are leading in this way, like uh, Mandiant and others. Um, CrowdStrike, Deloitte, who are looking at how they work to protect com commerce as well as the private sector. So I, today we want to talk a variety of topics. Um, all of you will recognize these aren't all the topics out there, but we could do this probably um, until, you know, Maria retires um, and uh, still not cover all the rich that's out there. So just really, really appreciate um, Maria and Paul for helping us set this up and the team of participants today. We're gonna to go ahead and just introduce people as um, where they're going to talk about what it is they're seeing out in the world. And um, we'll go from one session to another, um, 15 minutes each company, and then we'll save questions to the end. Um, so with that, we're going to start with Varun Vera, who is the Chief Op Operating Officer of C4 ADS. Uh, he was there previously, their chief of analysis, and oversaw projects and investigations across various illicit systems, including narcotics trafficking, asset tracing, wildlife tracking, and conflict financing. It's been featured in intelligence briefings from the highest levels of the U.S. government and uh, various government agencies, Department of State. Before that, he worked at the World Bank and uh, received his bachelor's degrees in international relations and economics from Syracuse and a master's from George Washington University. So with that, Rune, I'd love to turn it over to you and um, share what C4 ADS is up to. Awesome. Let me just turn my slides on. Hopefully everybody can see those. Great. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Brian Vera. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at C4 ADS, as Kristen, um, as Kristen mentioned. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work uh, to detect adversary GNSS and GPS spoofing activities, so hopefully slightly different to the traditional types of OSINT and PAI works that you guys probably hear about. Before I kind of jump in, just 1,000 foot view, the reason that C4EDS, so we're, we're an organization very much born in the age of PAI, publicly available data, uh, publicly available information. The reason that we think this publicly available information is so powerful, this world is so powerful, is because of a, a certain understanding that we have of the world, the way the logistics sort of function. And very simply, what that means is an adversary actor, an illicit actor, really no matter who they are, whether they're a wildlife trafficker and North Koreans trying to move something, generally, if you're operating at a certain level of scale, you need to nest your illicit activities within illicit systems, whether it's trade, finance, transportation, whatever else. So you got to ship you know, a container with some hidden part in the bank guarantee letter, an insurance paperwork, all of this information that essentially leaves behind a digital trail within these systems. And that really creates an opportunity for, for folks like us. You can really start to map out those networks, see those activities, um, and think about ways to disrupt them where applicable. So really the highest level point that I'm kind of getting at, and hopefully you'll see that across the various presentations today, is that frankly, the way we see it is if your challenge, which nearly everyone does, intersects with the global economy in some way or intersects with the illicit systems in some way, um, there's likely some form of PAI solution to be exposing, monitoring, and ultimately disrupting uh, that activity. So from that, just very quickly, um, we are a nonprofit organization based out of Washington, D.C. 
Um, we have a clear mission to go after these transnational listed and malign threat networks. Maybe the key piece is to, to be versatile, to be effective in this world that we're operating in. Really, we're building sort of a capability. We're not really subject matter experts of this and that, but we have an investigative capability that fuses together people, data, and technology. And in the process of doing so, creates very actionable um, investigative capability that's been used to support the government in multiple different ways. So with that, just conscious of time, um, I want to jump straight into the demo, um, which hopefully should show you how some of this, this works. But as I was saying, what, we're, what this project sought to do was to use purely open sources of information on a fairly SIGINTI type problem set, which is how do you see Russia, which is a fairly advanced leader in this, this field of electronic warfare, can you find ways to detect um, its remote uh, spoofing activities? So that was really the goal of what we were trying to sort of achieve here. So firstly, just what is GNSS spoofing for those who are not aware? So I was not until very recently. Well, the basic point is pretty much everything you use today, whether using the stock market, the internet, your cell phone, whatever else, requires on pretty precise data related to positioning, navigation, and timing. And the, the point is that often this is transmitted unencrypted and can be manipulated by um, actors in different ways. And this is a really emerging sort of criminal and national security uh, issue that has a lot of applications that are pretty terrifying, right? And you've got some sort of here, the one that always scares me the most is from the second from the bottom, which is think uh, on where it's gonna strike. Spoofing or jamming that can make it think it's moving somewhere else. So it can redirect the, the weapon somewhere else. The stock exchange is another example. If you can manipulate that timing by, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, Imagine the amount of sort of leverage and trade you'd be able to do. In this case, the one I'm going to talk about is probably the first one, which is often you're seeing a lot of this in spoofing to hide or to disguise or to manipulate where fleets are moving, ships and planes um, to disguise where they're, they're operating. So that's really where we'll, we'll start and where we'll kind of focus today. So firstly, we just started this project a couple of years ago, um, starting from just a series of headlines that seemed to indicate there was some pretty weird activity happening in the Black Sea or in waters off the coast of Russia. So that's where we started. And so we start from this, this uh, Wired article that mentioned the ship called the Atria, a container ship, a tanker named the Atria that was operating in the Black Sea that was, uh, that was witnessing a lot of this activity. So the first thing that we do is we jump over into our, our, our maritime domain uh, tracking software, Windward. Enter the ship's name, Atria, look for it, and we pull it up. We then can see the ship on the specific day um, on which this GPS activity was, or this interference activity was reported. And as we can see, you can see the ship right there in the Black Sea. Those dots you're seeing are where it was located, and the green lines are the path between the, the transmission dots. As you can see right away, we're pretty seeing some pretty weird activity. This is obviously a ship, an oil tanker. It's not supposed to be on land. Although it does certainly seem that there seem to be tracks jumping onto somewhere on land near the coast of Galenjik um, in, in Russia. So you can see that a little bit more clearly here. You can see the ship sort of moving. That's a little red dot. And every now and again, it'll be moving on sea, moving on sea, moving on sea. And all of a second, it appears to jump to somewhere on land. So this is what we want to investigate. So we overlay the satellite imagery, zoom into that location, and immediately we can see it seems to be being spoofed to the middle of what appears to be an airport runway. So again, pretty weird activity. We're interested in understanding what's going on here. So the first thing that we want to see is, is this just an anomaly of some sort, right? Is this just a, a, a data glitch that we're sort of looking at? So what we do is we draw essentially a bounding box around this airport. And we seek to look for any other um, AAS data pings, so AAS being the, the ship transmission uh, data, any other ships that also report that data uh, or that GPS pings being located to that airport. And lo and behold, as you can kind of see here, on that same day, at that same time, we're seeing a whole number of ships that appear to be displaying the same sort of activity as our initial uh, target of interest, the Atria. 
So now we want to zoom this out a little bit, right? We're seeing some weird activity in this one Galenjic airport area. Is this something more pervasive? Is this happening sort of elsewhere? So what the analysts do is they basically pull out all transmission paths that they can see in AS data over the period of a year um, for any ship in the vicinity of Russia that appears to show a GPS location pinging to some airport somewhere in Russia. And as you can see, they do their code and whatever else to, to get there. Um, we, we transmit or we, we import these results into our analytical software into Palantir. And here we can start seeing this activity does seem quite pervasive. We're seeing that it appears at certain times. You can see from the dots here, we were looking at the Black Sea area, but there seemed to be a whole number um, of areas, including around Sochi, where this activity seems to be being reported. And as you can see, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of ships being spoofed to several airports. We were looking at Galenjic Airport, which appears to be the second more pervasive. There appear to be a number of other airports where this activity seems to be happening. And this, I'm not the technical person, but just looking at the time series where it shows where certain signals um, turn off before new ones turn on, um, appears to show that this is manually directed in some way or the other. It's not some automated um, system that's appearing. The next step is we want to start to trace back to see if we can actually identify uh, the transmitter or where this activity is originating from or this, this spoofing activity is originating from. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look for, a, we want to do some line of sight calculations where, where are the locations from which, because this GPS spoofing requires direct line of sight to the target vessel from the transmitter. So where are locations along this Russian coast where you would have that line of sight analysis to as many ships as possible that appear to be uh, displaying that inference activity. And so immediately we can start triaging down. There's not a huge amount of areas that, that cover a large majority of the ships. And in fact, as we zoom in, there's only really one or two locations that have over 98% uh, line of sight to all the vessels we identified being, being uh, interfered with. And one in particular, appears pretty interesting, which is this facility of sorts uh, along the coast, which has, again, the, the only location where we had 99 plus percent uh, likelihood of the transmitter being based. When we zoom into this location, and this is where we can start now overlaying different sources of PAI. So we pull the property records out of Russia to find that the land um, just adjacent to the property or on all the roads sort of leading into the property appears to be owned by the FSB Border Directorate. When we start sort of mapping out the cadastral records for the, the, the site itself, we can see the network chart at the bottom. You find a convoluted shell company sort of structured three layers back um, are two wives of senior GRU officers that appear to own the, the facility. You can see from journalists who have been around their security outside the facility um, attributed to the FSO. And you can see from satellite imagery that there's radio antennas and a whole host of equipment at the facility that could potentially be, um, be the, the source of this interference activity. And lo and behold, the point is, this comes out a couple of years later from when we publish it, but that site, that facility that we located was actually Putin's billion dollar palace made famous in the Novani expose. And as you can see, it includes sort of a radar domed array pretty nearby. Um, which again, when we start looking at sort of the cadastral records around those, find that the same time as this facility was being constructed was purchased by the Ministry of Defense for the purpose of land and airspace defense. So we think using, again, not knowing what we were looking for, just starting from an interference activity, we're able to triage back to a pretty sensitive uh, and protected facility. So last things now, just as I start to close out a little bit, we wanted to take those findings and expand them across Russia. We use those to find one specific facility. Can you see other things with this, uh, with this methodology? And one of the other places that we find a lot of the same sort of interference activity happening appears to be just off the coast of Syria. Uh, so we wanted to take a look there. And in that case, working with the, the University of UT Austin, we were actually able to triage down to a very specific GPS coordinate where we thought this activity was originating from. And in this case, lo and behold, we got lucky. There was a, a video that came out earlier that showed one of Russia's most advanced electronic warfare mobile systems um, that appeared to be located just exactly at that site. 
And these exact same systems are now appearing um, in significant numbers in Ukraine. And I think it was a pretty big DIA haul to be able to capture one of those relatively recently and have it exported back to the U.S. We're also able to use different sources of information now. So traditionally, we've been using a lot of AAS data in this example I've shown you so far. So the transponders off ships. But in this case, we use ADSV data, the transponders off planes. And what you're looking at right now are the tracks of uh, the Russia's Tupolev 214 um, air fleet. So everywhere that they've been sort of flying over the last year. And again, that seems to correspond pretty closely with uh, areas of interference activity as well that we're seeing. So there's multiple ways this could be could be uh, uh, transmitted. The final piece is we try to expand our findings more globally. We're seeing this in Russia. We know them to be a pretty advanced electronic warfare actor, but we know there's several others. Um, are we seeing this in other adversary uh, countries as well? And the answer is yes, we are. Um, so off Iran in the Persian Gulf, um, there's started to be quite a lot of activity. Uh, that shows the same type of activity of vessels appearing to be spoofed to airports um, in the vicinity. Why is this important? Because we also see this happening at some pretty sensitive times. So when the tanker Sena and Para was seized, for example, several ships in the area were displaying interference activity. And this would be a classic way, by the way, to create that Cassus Belli, right? Is um, the, if you spoof the vessel a little bit, it strays without quite realizing into Iranian territorial, water, territorial waters, giving you the excuse to seize the ship. You could apply the same thing to South China Sea anywhere else. We're also working in PAI means that you can actually share information. You get information from a lot of partners or sources. So in this case, just putting some of the work out there uh, led to several ship captains actually sharing um, their, their GPS information um, as in when they're seeing this activity. So this was a captain who reached out to us uh, when he was operating near the ports of Shanghai and saying that he was seeing a lot of activity seeming to happen in that region. Again, when we trace this down, certainly we see several other ships um, appearing to, to display this activity. And we saw a lot of that spoofing appearing to come to a specific location within close vicinity of several Chinese naval bases. And in fact, in this one case, what we're seeing is a different type of activity that we hadn't quite seen before, which will just show up in just a second, where before we're seeing spoofing happening to a single point. What we're seeing happening in China is something we hadn't seen before, which is this very weird circular sort of spoofing activity that actually is moving around a smokestack. Um, and what it appears to be an abandoned smokestack. So some just a very weird activity happening that we can't quite explain, but gives you a sense for where your adversaries may be um, pioneering capabilities that are not quite as familiar to us right now. Gives you a sense of where they may be developed. Okay, so my last sort of point here, just as I conclude, is PAI can give you um, some pretty unique advantage, right? And there's a lot of different types of PAI data sources that are open, that are available for immediate use. And as I was kind of trying to show today, um, it's not about a single source of information, right? There's a lot of different, different pieces that can give your individual value. But just in this one example that I showed you today, we pieced together at least these six different forms of PAI data, probably a lot more. So everything out from what everybody's familiar with when we talk about OSINT, there was a lot of just targeted, clever Google searching to find the things that they need. But it also involved location data, transport data at scale, the use of boutique, corporate, and property registries on demand, social media, all of these other things, piecing it together to build that integrated picture. And that's my final point here is the data is available. The technology is available. You just need to posture to, to ingest and incorporate it. Skilled analysts are probably going to be the choke point because in this world, you're still very much going to need the human in the loop to make those insights, make those judgments, and ultimately create the methodology. So, okay, that was my presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Varun. Hi, Kristen. Over to you. Oh, it wouldn't be me if I didn't leave myself muted on a call at least once uh, a week. So thanks, Maria. Um, thank you so much. I know that folks really ha are, have a lot of questions, so feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but we are going to move right on to Altana AI and Amanda Young, who are very uh, happy to have join us today. Amanda is the Federal Solutions Analyst at Altana, serving the intelligence and DoD portfolio. Prior to that, she held roles for ranging from product development to customer service. 
She attended the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where she studied nonproliferation and terrorism, while also working at the James Barton Center for Nonproliferation Studies, conducting open source intelligence analysis with a specialty in geospatial imagery analysis. So Amanda, we're very happy to have you and Alpana here today. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much for having us. All right. So again, my name is Amanda and I am a federal solutions analyst at Altana. Ultimately, my role is to aid customers in deriving mission utility from our platform offerings. Some of that is in creating relevant use cases such as what you will see today. I'm also here with my colleague, Rob Dunlap, who uh, would like to take a moment to quickly introduce himself. I'm Rob, Federal Solutions Architect for Altana. I work to figure out how our data can be official to customers, create custom use cases to house and develop new algorithms that are exploring the data, either through semi automation or exam patterns, or to make workflows more efficient. Thanks, Rob. So I'm sure you're asking yourselves, who is Altana? So Altana is a New York-based startup whose founders have a long history in the supply chain data world. Our founders created Altana with the vision of enabling globalization 2.0. And what I mean by that is the globalization of the last 75 years, which we refer to as globalization 1.0, has led to a breakdown in our global systems of production. We recognize the phrase supply chain issues is the new norm, and Altana aims to restore transparency visibility, resiliency, and most importantly, trust in our global business networks. The core value of our, is our knowledge graph, which we call the Atlas. The Atlas represents hundreds of millions of companies and facilities and billions of shipments. It fills intelligence gaps through unique data access from our partnerships with global enterprises and shipping and logistics companies, and the way we transform that data through machine learning to create a fused view of the world. The net result is a new medium of exchange for intelligence information. This is a snapshot of our UI showing all of our graph data elements in one picture. You have a physical flow, of, physical flow between facilities, facilities connected to companies, corporate networks, and risk exposure. To give you an idea of how we enable intelligence analysis, we have a use case to demonstrate how we can stitch together publicly available data, commercially available data, and our non public proprietary data, all unclassified to create insights that previously could not be created outside of the classified environments. So we're gonna start by setting the scene. Ultimately, our bottom line up front is that while the Atlas can be used for a variety of federal use cases for intelligence, in this case, it was used to enable an analyst to discover, expand, and exploit proliferation networks in Russia to identify new threats and new leads. We have organized this use case to reflect a workflow of a government analyst. We started with a tasking, and we aimed to answer four key questions throughout this investigation. Methodologically, we started this analysis by using previously identified businesses known to be doing business with Russian companies. We know these companies because in 2021, the Department of Commerce listed 14 entities on the BIS entity list for their direct involvement or support of Russia's chemical and biological weapons programs. One of those companies, Real Chemi, which operates in Germany, is reported to have sent dual use goods to Torgovi Dom Kimid, a company based in Russia, which I'll refer to as TD Kimid through the rest of the converse, this conversation today. So the four intelligence questions that we are answering throughout this investigation are reflected on the right-hand side of this slide. Can a user corroborate this information using data from the Atlas? Can a user develop the network of these known companies? Can a user identify a threat nexus linked to the direct network of these known companies? And can a user define a pattern of life to identify a threat nexus outside of this direct network using spectral analysis? In an attempt to corroborate these reports and show the breadth and capability of the Altana Atlas, we set out to further characterize this direct threat network, identify indicators of known unknown threat networks, and identify a pattern of life of previously unknown actors engaged in proliferation activities using AI. So first, the Atlas corroborates the trade relationship between Real Chemi and TD Kimid, which is reflected in the top left picture. Underlying shipment data identifies nearly 2,500 shipments of both chemical and biological dual-use goods. Additionally, we corroborate Real Chemi is owned and directed by several Russian citizens. Further developing the network, we see in the bottom left picture, 
TD Kimmet is managed by Vladimir Nikolaevich Kulagin, a department head of Siberian Federal University, whose parent organization is the Ministry of Science and Higher Education of the Russian Federation, and has influential government officials such as Dmitry Medvedev on its board of trustees. So then we identify the threat nexus. Further traversal of the atlas identifies additional indicators of a threat nexus, such as the top left picture, revealing a shipment of ethyl dichlorophosphate, which is listed on the Australia Group's dual use chemical weapons precursors list. Ethyl dichlorophosphate which is worth noting as it is identified as a pre precursor for Novichok agents. Prior to 2018, Novichok was a rumored Russian developed nerve agent and it is known for the targeted poisonings of the scribbles in London and more recently, opposition leader Alexei Navalny. The shipment is being sent by a new company of interest, Acros Organics, to TD Kimid. The Atlas also reveals similar shipments to two additional Russian companies with state ties and facility co-location to a state-run research institution for organic chemistry. Additionally, we identified an open source report that the DOJ was investigating two Bolobovan citizens living in the U.S. for attempting to mask their running of multiple companies sending chemical and biological goods to Real Chemi. With the Atlas, we identified Rochester Chemical, LLC, Americargo Express, LLC, and Global Chemical Co. were sending goods directly to TD Kimid and other Russian companies. These business networks reflected in the bottom left picture revealed shared suppliers and potential new leads beyond TD Kimid. And finally, we take our analysis a step further. My, Rob colle my colleague, Rob Dunlap, created an HF spectral analysis algorithm to identify other companies with similar export patterns among thousands of companies in the extended network. This slide shows the outline of our methodology from left to right and some of the analytical findings produced. For context, HS refers to harmonized system codes, which is a standardized numerical method of classifying traded products. This methodology is outlined, the methodology outlined is included to ingest our own entities from the BIS entity list. We then define the signature based on geography, product type, number of shipments, and the trade direction. The algorithm then programmatically compares signatures of candidates to define spectra and identifies new leads outside of the direct network of Real Chemi and TD Chemid. Through this analysis, we identified the top spectral matches as reflected in the bottom right photo. This includes additional known bad actors validating this methodological approach, as well as logistics carriers that are potential new targets for future analytical investigations. So our intention with this is to make this a repeatable process that can be applied in several different contexts and aid in the research, traversal, and identification of new leads for future investigation and for our partners within the DOD and the IC. Thank you so much for having us. Amanda, thank you so much. That was terrific, uh, really insightful. So we appreciate the opportunity. And again, we're gonna hold questions to the end. Um, feel free to put them in the chat though, so we don't forget what they are as we go on to our uh, next amazing speakers from uh, 3AI. Um, very excited to introduce Jacob Ayers Thomas Thompson and Hassan Salam Salamani. Sorry, uh, Hassan, I'm probably butchering your name. Um, Jacob has 24 years of experience in data science, actuarial consulting, and equity trading, and he is the head of investment data science team at Just Group and a former senior actuarial consult actuarial uh, consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, one of the top 50 UK data leaders in finance. Uh, first set of 320, which is amazing. Um, Hassan has 24 years experience in global markets and finance. He was the managing director of Goldman Sachs International Europe Global Markets Division, a director at Barclays Investment Bank Global Markets Division, co-chair uh, at the DNI Disability Council at Barclays, and um, an incredible uh, academic career at the London School of Economics and Oxford. So um, gentlemen, I know you're going to tag team in your presentation, so we'll turn it over to you and 3AI. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, so let me just uh, do a quick screen share.
Great. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having us here today. My name is Hassan Salamoni, and I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer at 3AI. Um, thank you very much, Kristen and team, for the very kind introduction uh, and invitation to be here. And it's a real privilege to be talking to you all today at today's talk at the Belfast Centre. Um, so we're here today uh, to talk a little bit around uh, geopolitical evaluation um, using financial AI. Um, here at 3AI, our core focus uh, is evaluating companies. Um, our our day-to-day -day is spent um, using uh, a very um, a deep uh, and broad scale uh, AI uh, factor framework, which we use to analyze companies. And our core business is really providing insights and analytics to investment managers. And we also build a, a whole series of different types of investment indices. Um, but it's through our work and through our deep work of evaluating companies that we've come to realize that this can have a huge insight uh, and impactful information when it comes to assessing um, you know, broader areas, uh, you know, such as the, the nation state. Um, so just to kind of like frame our conversation today, <clears throat> the way that we think about companies is that um, by, by empirically understanding um, how a company is, is, uh, is consisted of, uh, what contributes to that company's uh, outlook, um, um, what, are the, what are the positive components, what are the negative components, through all of that, you can build a very, very granular um, bottom-up approach, not only to a company, but then as you as you work higher through through the framework up to the, up to the nation state. Um, ultimately, by understanding what's happening at a company level, you're able to derive very interesting and impactful insights of what's happening um, at the nation state level. Um, and this has led us to um, uh, derive some very very interesting findings in different regions around the world particularly areas at the moment, um, you know, which are under very close consideration or have been you know, impacted by a variety of different things, you know, including war, sanctions, and, and different types of activities. Um, just before we go into that, um, what I'd like to do is, is, is give you a little bit of an overview um, in terms of uh, how, we, how we undertake our work. Um, so um, I've mentioned already that we're an AI and machine learning company. Um, we have built what we kind of believe is, is, is the most sophisticated factor framework that's out there in terms of analyzing and studying a company at a, at a company level. Um, so we've developed over 326 factors, which study everything across a company's outlook from um, accounting, from technical treatments, uh, from shareholder activity, uh, through to credit risk models, uh, through to valuations through to a whole variety of different metrics. And all of these have been engineered um, over time um, and have been added to um, uh, over time and has allowed us to build this framework, which effectively means that we can understand and study companies in something like a 326 degree lens. So it's a deeper understanding that has been undertaken before. Um, we do this uh, by using publicly and commercially available data sets. So we mine and harvest a huge amount of data um, that we're able to access, all of which is, uh, you know, I would stress is publicly and commercially available. Uh, and we're also able to analyze and process um, over 18,000 research analyst reports. So we're able to have a, a real deep dive, both in terms of expert view on, on, on what is happening. And we're able to use our machine learning framework to extrapolate that from the real value, so the real insight of, of what's happening. Um, within, our, within our universe of, of companies that we cover, we have over 20,000 uh, companies within that universe. Um, it's, it, and, and that equates to over 99% of the world's global stock market. So um, through our framework, uh, we're able to deep dive and analyze uh, and focus in on any aspect of, uh, of, of, of the world. Uh, stock market, any country, any region, right down into the into the into the company level. Um, you might ask us, well, look, you know, how do you, how do you differentiate yourselves? Um, why is what you're doing better than than what else is out there? Well, what we typically do is we will compare ourselves to human experts. Um, what we have built is effectively machine expert level of understanding uh, companies. Um, 
And, and what we then try and do is, is compare ourselves to what a human expert is able to do and, and their ability to predict uh, how a company is likely to perform uh, and how a company is likely to underperform. And, and consistently over time, our ability to identify the world's best companies uh, or the world's best performing companies uh, versus identifying the world's worst performing companies is consistently proven over time. And this, this chart here just um, outlines that and gives you a little bit of an indication of uh, the companies that we've identified over the course of 2021, how they've gone on to perform versus companies identified by the world's top uh, analysts. Uh, and similarly, um, companies that we have identified who are likely to go on and underperform and how those have compared to the world's um, leading research analysts. And, and the ability to do that, the ability to count which companies are going to go on and do well and which companies are going on to do poorly gives us a very rich framework to deep dive in and build that up then at a, at a nation level and understand the outlook uh, for a nation's uh, prospect, uh, perspective um, outcomes. I'm going to hand over to here now to Jake, who's going to take you through a little bit at a country level, some of the insights that we've been able to, um, to derive. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, just before we jump off this slide, the, um, we're not surprised that our machine learning outperforms the analysts because as I mentioned, there's about, about 18,000 equity research analysts that we, that we cover between them producing around about a hundred thousand or so analyst reports on a periodic basis, um, on around about 12,000 or so companies, maybe 10,000 companies. Um, so our, our machine learning essentially has the advantage of uh, ingesting and learning from all of their research over the last, since the inception of the database upon which equity research analysts are submitted, which is called the interactive brokers estimate system, and um, plus all the financial data, plus the technical data, plus sentiment, plus reading other reports, plus looking at third party models. So if you think about machine learning, which is, um, which obviously needed with large data sets, um, it is essentially, essentially a conditional realistic, uh, analyst. Um, and so it's able to leverage that information and, and, and meld it with other sources as well. So we, we've deeply tested, um, our AI systems since they've been live, uh, which is now just under three years and in repeated testing, the, the, the P values, statistical values of, of, of live predictions over the course of the following year across a, a large number of stocks in our case around 20,000 is, is coming out at basically zero to the, to, to the, um, achievable decimal points of a typical setting on a computer of say 16 or 32. Um, so there's more evidence that our machine learning is working than there is for the typical drug that the FDA authorizes for human consumption. Um, their statistical criteria is, is, is way, way weaker, um, than what we achieve. So, um, if we just jump forward last on to the, the next slide. So, um, Christine approached us and, and it was, we were surprised to be approached originally because our focus as has mentioned is is for the professional investment community and, and, and really to investing. Um, but we, um, Christine was interested in how we could, um, look at things using our data and what insights we might find. So there's two that we're going to share with you today. Um, one is, is, is on Russia. So, um, one of the interesting things was actually what, what effect have sanctions really had, um, on Russia. Uh, what effect has that war had on, on Russia? So if we could jump back or think back to the first slide, Hassan shared about, um, the source of all wealth for a nation essentially comes from companies because employees and their consumption comes from their ability to have jobs. Um, if they work for the government, well, the government is funded by tax, which comes from corporation tax and employment, uh, income and from sales tax. So essentially without companies, there is no country, there is no government and there is no tax. So, um, so if we look at. Russia, for example, if we think of the stock market really for what it is, which is a kind of, um, uh, the wisdom of crowds, the best guesstimate of, of, uh, the global investment community as to the future wealth creation of a nation, because that's really what companies price. Companies are very reactive and they price future wealth creation. If we, if we, if we think of it in that perspective, um, and we look at, um, the Marx index, which is the Russia index, we see that at the point Russia invaded Ukraine, the market had already been in decline and, and crashed somewhat. Um, and this goes back to around, uh, August, 2021, the invasion, I think it was Feb 20th, um, 2022. So the, um, if we look over to the right, we've actually have our, our, 
our rankings on, on all the Russian stocks. So we think we look at that, um, using our AI, which is looking at over 30 billion data points, 326 compressed into 326 models or factors on every stock, um, but with over 50,000 AI models that fit those 326 factors. So it's like a lot of work, but our work really is to compress 30 billion data points into one, which is the expected future performance of a stock. This chart on the right shows that our actual AI, when, when assessing the future for the, for the Russian market, um, didn't really significantly decline until the point of the war. It's much more concerned with fact, um, and, and, and less in a way with, uh, speculation. But what we also observe is that despite the fall in, 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 in the Russian market, um, we have seen a, a continued decline in the evaluation of the Russian stock market, i.e. its future. So if we, what we did is to clean the Russian index, the first way we do this is a more conventional trader type method. So we rip out the, the impacts on other markets to try to isolate the singular, uh, impact on the Russian market. That's that green line. We then apply our AI, which is a, a micro level on every company in Russia, um, with a, with a deep lens of analysis on each of those companies and predictive accuracy that that's proven to effectively reprice the Russian market to, to revalue the Russian market impacting for the future discount, um, which comes out from the, the decayed outlook for each of these companies. What we actually observe over this time period, um, is, is, is an estimated 50% larger impact on the Russian stock market than is actually perceived by the market, by looking at market prices. So over this time period, there's 2.2 billion loss resulting from war and sanctions on the Russian market. Um, with our analysis, we see that to be about 372 billion. Now we could extend this analysis to be quite interesting to look at Germany, to look at US, to look at other countries, and we could extend this work to then focus in on individual, um, actions or items via the media, via an LP text and, and isolate and locate those items down. What we have done here, if we step over to the next slide is, um, is, is look at it in the, in the way that we look at it and our and the investment community look at it. And, and what we see is that. Um, which is quite interesting is that in Russia, the decay in the forecast on average across Russian stocks, um, or should we call it what we call negative alpha. So in the investment community, alpha is expected out on performance relative to other stocks. Um, if we look at Russia, the real, uh, impact has, has been uh, a decay in, in, in the clarity or certainty of their business models, much more than for example, credit risk. So we saw with Russia, we see a minor negative, uh, experience expected return resulting from credit risks, but it's not what one might expect. So it seems that the machine learning is essentially figuring out that the Russian companies have had to pivot and shift their business models a bit, but they are managing to still operate and they're just having to operate in new places, i.e. to transact with whoever, you know, like uh, China, Turkey, rather than say with Europe or the, or the U S. So, um, but the uncertainty in the business models, it has been a, or does look like it's having a, uh, more of a negative impact there. Um, and we see a little bit of that actually in China as well, which, which may be to do with somewhat the continued lockdowns that, that they persisted with, et cetera. Um, fine, well, we can cover more in question. That sounds great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. No, thank you. That was terrific. Um, really, uh, interesting, uh, novel approach to looking at problems um, in what would have been an impossible way even 10 years ago. Very, very happy um, to also introduce someone who's looking at um, a, a, an enduring problem for the world, really, in a novel way, uh, Samuel Couret of Zero Trafficking. He's formerly an active duty Marine intelligence officer and international real estate corporate attorney, which I do have to figure out how that happened together. Um, extensive experience in all sorts of intelligence analysis, private equity compliance, and intelligence training. He is the COO at Zero Trafficking, which is an intelligence technology intelligence technology startup founded to fight human trafficking and their related criminal networks by hunting organized traffickers online. They work with local and federal law enforcement, prosecutors, financial institutions and strategic litigators to build actionable data products that target criminal networks where they are most vulnerable. Samuel, over to you. Thank you very much, Kristen. And it really is uh, an honor to be here. I really enjoyed the presentations uh, so far and 
hope uh, you all enjoy uh, what we've got to talk here uh, about today. I'm going to be talking about finding the open door, how human trafficking network discovery can assist with broad uh, threat network collection. And so uh, human trafficking has been and, and continues to be that pervasive global problem. And here in the United States, since the year 2000, when we first passed the Trafficking Victims and Protection Act, um, there's been a substantial both domestic and global effort to combat human trafficking. Uh, but even with all those efforts, it continues to grow. And there, we, we've spoken with a tremendous amount of law enforcement folks at the federal and local level, victim advocates, and, and prosecutors. And we found that uh, an over-reliance on victim testimony, almost as a gating mechanism on determining whether or not an investigation goes forward, instead of prioritizing human trafficking networks, means that this crime goes wildly under-prosecuted. Now, there's good news, and that is the, the National Action Plan to Combat Human Trafficking, which came out of the last two administrations, is a big shift in focus and says, we're going to prioritize human trafficking networks as opposed to gating our investigation based on victim cooperation. And that can have a tremendous impact, even if there's charges that are other than human trafficking charges, perhaps there's racketeering charges that are pursued or money laundering. And so all of this relates back to the conversation we've been having today about open source intelligence because of these three main reasons. And the first, the first issue is that human trafficking is the nexus between many organized criminal efforts. This is something that we understand in the OSINT community because we operate in the world of data, not in the world of siloed capability. A lot of things interconnect and we exploit those connections in our work. Um, and there's tremendous academic and anecdotal support for that claim that human trafficking is not isolated and separate from the world of criminal networks. It's kind of part and parcel to that world. But human trafficking is, is unique in a way that's very important. They have a persistent business need to advertise in the clear web. Drug traffickers don't have that need. Your money launderers certainly don't uh, advertise in the clear web. Uh, and your weapons trafficking uh, individuals, they don't advertise in that same way. So if we're combining these two things, that's really what the third point is, is that combining the fact that human trafficking is related to all these other non-human trafficking activities and human trafficking is particularly allowed in publicly available information, then we now have an incredibly rich publicly available information data set on transnational organized crime. Another way of thinking about this is that the criminal network is the apparatus, the infrastructure, the people, uh, and the criminal lines of business is what they use that apparatus for. Maybe it's uh, money laundering, narcotics, extortion, uh, robbery, prostitution, or sex work. And some of these lines of business are more susceptible to, to open source intelligence collection than others. And if you can trace back to the criminal network, then you can use the network that you found against a whole number of different targets and use case applications. Final way I'll display this graphically is, is you've got human trafficking over here on the right side of the graph. They've got that anonymity avoidance where they are reaching out uh, for customers as part of their business. And the folks on the left-hand side, those activities that are more frequently targeted um, by, by the government and by uh, private risk-focused organizations, they are not putting those signatures out into the public domain, but there is that shared network that connects them. And so the publicly available information targeting opportunities you get from one activity, you can use against all of the illicit activities. So let's talk about the persistent need to advertise here. You've got buyers and sellers uh, in the market. Uh, they need to meet each other. Uh, they don't always know each other. They need that advertising activity. Um, and, and so many of them turn to the web to reach their customers. Now, in a weapons trafficking uh, scenario, it's a, it's a high dollar transaction. And so there's an, there's an extensive amount of due diligence that takes place. 
Uh, the larger the transaction, the more due diligence is justified. You want to make sure you're not selling to government agents on the other side. But in the world of sex trafficking, there's not that level of due diligence. You have a very small transaction size and you have buyers that uh, want to buy at a particular time uh, right now. And there's not going to be a tremendous amount of due diligence done. The way criminal networks monetize their human trafficking is to sell multiple times over and over small transactions and then compete for that customer audience via advertising. Now, the reason why I lay all that out is because there are certain types of information that's in those advertisements that answer needs of the buyers and sellers. And that looks like contact information, phone numbers, email addresses, physical locations, dates and times of availability. These are things that buyers need from sellers and sellers share in these publicly available advertisements. Buyers also, because there is some risk to them uh, involved in this, they publish information from reviews and uh, it, because they don't want to get robbed in these transactions. And so as a result of that, we've got very, very specific data from sellers and buyers in the human trafficking marketplace that's publicly available and allows us to identify criminal networks that do a whole litany of activities other than human trafficking. So what we've done is turn this into a, a cycle, an OSINT cycle, where we discover the relevant data sources. They are regionally uh, different. You're going to have different forums for buyers and sellers to interact with each other and reach each other in different parts of the world. But the data is ubiquitous. Wherever there is a population center, you're going to see this type of buyer and seller communication and advertising. Within that, we move on to step two. We find what are the markers uh, that behind an advertisement, instead of it being an independent person, there is an organization behind that advertisement. And that is our step two. Step three is, is this a scam? Is an actual physical meet going to take place? We want to identify uh, who is just trying to take advantage of credulous buyers uh, and scam them and steal their identity. And where are the criminal networks that are probably involved in multiple lines of criminal business? And step four is we take all of that contact information, we take all of those indicators, and we pivot throughout the world of publicly available information in order to expand on that, on that information. And remember, this is the contact information, affiliated profiles, locations and insights to movement, pattern of life information that all kind of get us started from those seller generated advertisements. Within those suspicious data points in step two, we're looking at anything that indicates that the person depicted in the advertisement is not working on their own. They're not working by themselves. So multiple women in advertisements, multiple contact uh, points of, of information that's spread across a, a wide population, all of that tells us that there might be an organization behind this that we can then further target. Eliminating false flags and, and getting rid of markers of, of scamming from the list allows us to kind of purify that data set that we assemble in step two before moving on to step four. And that is just basically pivoting off all of the information in the advertisements what can you find from a phone number? What can you find from an email address? What can you find uh, from an image? Perhaps an image can take you to a social media profile. Social media profile can take you to location information. All of these types of, uh, of things that we exploit in step four. At the end of the day, what you get is a target set, a target set of criminal networks curated from around the world that you can then use to uh, look for illicit financial transactions that you may not have found, to look for uh, drug and narcotics activity that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, and so tremendous number of uses with this data. So I'll take you into an individual case and kind of walk you through how that's discovered. The customer activity, uh, review activity online told us that out of the 300 some odd illicit massage businesses in Greater Phoenix, that, uh, that these two businesses were the most favored by the, the customer base. And 
you can really skip past uh, all of the information on this slide. We, we found some useful corporate information, but the major indicator to us at the bottom was that tremendous number of women were rotating through this business as the workforce. And the same thing was happening at this, at this other business. And that review activity also told us and made very, very clear that uh, this workforce was shared across these two businesses. These businesses were affiliated to each other. So we continued to chart that out saying who is working where, when, and what's the rotation back and forth to map that out. And we identified that, yes, there's a, there's strong confirmation information about the fact that these two businesses are really just part of a larger organization. They share phone numbers on a given profile. Um, and finally, we had enough information to pivot into uh, Ventel type data and look at some cell phone locations. So, so what we're doing here is we're drawing a geofence around the top spa in one part of Phoenix, drawing a geofence around the great spa and drawing a geofence around that corporate registration address in Beaumont, California. We identified uh, a couple of anonymous location-based signals. This is all commercially available data uh, affiliated with this individual, Yin Hao Huang, who lives at 1420 Midnight Sun Drive, all available from public uh, data sources. Uh, he, he has a lot of his information uh, online uh, that he's self-published. He puts his military history online, uh, a tremendous amount of data. And we were able to pivot around those, those data sites to get his phone numbers, his social media handles, his affiliated email addresses, and finally do some interesting pattern of life assessment. Uh, his, his wife uh, was linked to him via social media and some public records, um, and they lived together at 1428 Midnight Sun Drive, according to those records. Now their pattern of life is very, very interesting because they make repeated runs to Los Angeles International Airport right before driving across the desert to Phoenix to bring in new workers to Great Spa and Top Spa, and then make a bunch of different stops at various financial institutions on the way back to California. Now, this is consistent with the pattern uh, that we would expect to see of new women being brought into the country uh, to work at these two illicit businesses and then uh, financial transactions spread out across a number of different institutions so that you wouldn't trigger things like a currency transaction report or suspicious account report, uh, those transactions going up to FinCEN at the Department of the Treasury. And so uh, because we knew that all of this apparatus was a larger apparatus than what you would need to just run two locations, we were looking for the other business locations tied to this criminal network. Given the high turnover rate of the, of the workers, we knew that they were going somewhere else. And diving into corporate records uh, assigned to uh, Zhen Ming Lin, we found this collection of spas in Orlando, Florida. This collection of spas in Orlando, Florida operated just like the, the, the two spas did in Phoenix. They shared a population of workers. It was constant turnover. Uh, and they would spin up and spin down uh, various corporate entities to kind of uh, keep the paper trail a little bit light on a particular shell, a particular corporate entity. Ultimately, we saw a customer review monitoring these data sources, saying that they're leaving for Florida, that they're departing Phoenix and leaving for Florida. Because we had identified the uh, location information attached to the cell phone, and some rental, rental car records that were uh, you could look up based on driver's license information, we were able to find that actual trip from California all the way to Florida, terminating in that cluster of spas in Orlando. And that is the story of an individual network. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to talk about this. We're, we're very, very excited because we believe that human trafficking does not operate in a silo. It's very, very connected to a lot of other threat network activity. Uh, we've got other networks that trace back to Culiacan, Sinaloa, Mexico, that are uh, traced back to yacht companies in the Caribbean uh, linked to the drug trade. And, and all of these things are repeatable, scalable processes 
where we start with the needed buyer and seller interaction involved in human trafficking, move to network identification, then provide those networks in a way that can pivot to the other activities that they're involved in. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share, and I look forward to all of your questions. Thanks, Sam, so much. Um, it's uh, it's great to know that you're out there um, fighting on behalf of these people. Um, I want to turn now to um, Mike Spears at Faculty AI. Um, he'll be followed by Eric Sapp at Public Democracy, which will be the end of our um, list of speakers, and we'll have time for questions. So for folks, as a reminder, please um, put questions in the chat as you're hearing from individuals so we don't um, forget our questions as we hear yet um, more fascinating information. Um, Mike is Senior Manager at Faculty AI, um, Delivery Lead for on a counter disinformation platform through the UK government. Um, prior to joining faculty, Mike was a senior civil servant in the UK Health Security Agency and has spent nine years in central government departments. His career has focused on national security policy and delivery, and he's passionate about solving complex real world problems through the application of technology. Um, Mike, great to have you with us. Oh, I think you're still on Thank mute. You yeah, managed to get off that. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen and uh, Belfast Centre for inviting me to speak at this present uh, this webinar. Um, it's a real privilege to uh, discuss the topic of AI and uh, how it can be used to tackle disinformation, particularly in kind of the golden hours immediately after disinformation narratives start to spread. Um, so. Many of you probably haven't heard of faculty, so I thought I'd give a very brief overview into faculty. Faculty is Europe's most experienced data science specialist. We have roughly 200 um, PhD qualified data scientists, machine learning engineers, and delivery specialists. And as you can see from the slide here, we uh, have a focus on all sectors. We cover um, data science and AI in all sectors. Of particular interest to the group here, we have a focus on the UK government and the public sector and a specialism in national security and disinformation. We're also global leaders in um, AI safety um, and have research partnerships on AI explainability and safety with Harvard and University College. Now, very interestingly, um, I will also want to take you back in time, similar to uh, I think how Amanda did earlier today um, and discuss a um, poisoning in Salisbury in England in 2018 using Novichok nerve agent. Um, I'm going to use this as kind of a as starting of a case study around disinformation, uh, and the importance of countering disinformation early. So taking you back to that point in 2018, speculation in the immediate aftermath of this attack started to circulate that Russia may be behind it and Russia rolled out their kind of tried and tested approach, uh, to any of these types of types of insinuations that Russia was involved in such an attack. Firstly, they denied. And so they were not part of it. Uh, the second part, they deflected uh, and deflected back to the West and started to point to Russophobia in the West. And finally, they, they started to blame others. Um, and this is a point where they begin to flood the market with theories, with uh, potential solutions or alternative facts, as uh, uh, they might say, even if some of those narratives were completely conflicting. And in the immediate aftermath of this poisoning, there are roughly about 20 to 30 of these different narratives uh, circulating on social media. Now, these narratives range from MI6, uh, the UK intelligence agency being behind the plot, um, all the way through to this is just a drug overdose of, um, of Fulia and Sergei Sfilon in Salisbury. All of these narratives are then amplified by social media. So during this period, we saw a 4,000% increase in the spread of propaganda from Russia-based Twitter accounts. So huge amounts of work was going into amplifying these conflicting and disparate theories and narratives on the internet. Now this leads us to a point that I think everyone is aware of that in, in the immediate aftermath of an event, there is always an insatiable desire for information from the public and this playbook, this approach that Russia uses plays immediately into that innate desire from human beings to know what is going on. And so this causes the speculation to rise and to latch onto these disinformation theories and start to circulate themselves. 
Now, 48 hours later, we had this statement from the then uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson uh, in the House of Commons. And this was the first indication that Russia was uh, being considered to be behind this attack. Now in a, our 24 hour news cycle with a huge amounts of social media, um, this 48 hour period is a significant period of time with which speculation can rise and narratives can circulate. Now I understand the need for a government to be in full possession of the facts before they are able to act, uh, particularly in something where you start to attribute an attack uh, against a sovereign country, but there is still the importance of acting swiftly to counter disinformation, which needs to be balanced against this, this rigorous assessment and understanding. There are three main elements why countering disinformation early is incredibly important. The first one is that early response limits threat, limits the spread of that narrative. This is very similar to the approach that, um, around the importance of removing terrorist propaganda on the internet. As soon as it's on the internet, it starts to spread. So there's a, a, a thread of kind of a, the first golden hour of, um, terrorist propaganda being posted on the internet is the most important hour to try and remove. There's a similar consideration in terms of countering narratives as well. The longer it's out there before being addressed, the more likely it is that it will spread and it'll be difficult to then remove. The second is the scale of the information environment that we're now faced with. So if you consider back to where there was, um, previous animosity between the West and, and Russia during the Cold War period, there have been different uh, and distinct separate markets of information. So you'd have a UK market, you'd have a French market, a German market. Those information markets would have rarely, um, covered each other and rarely would have messages have jumped between the two or it would have been a lot slower. In current times, we are looking at an information ecosystem, the internet, which is incredibly interconnected. So interconnected, not just in terms of geography, but also in terms of platforms, social media accounts, individuals on those. And this creates a very complex web of disinformation narratives that can be spread very rapidly across different ecosystems. The final point around the importance of acting swiftly to counter disinformation is, is the continued influence effect of disinformation. So it, Research has shown that even after a disinformation narrative has been debunked, then this disinformation still exerts a lingering influence on people. There's been a huge amount of research into this after COVID and all the disinformation around COVID um, and COVID vaccinations, and that that impact was still seen further down the line, even after vaccine disinformation theories were debunked. So I've highlighted the importance of tackling uh, disinformation swiftly, but what is, what is limiting response at the moment? Now I pulled here a, um, a decision loop, uh, which effectively captures the decision-making process around how to counter uh, disinformation. There are four major pain points in the current process. Um, some of them look at over-reliance of government on third party providers, or the fact that they are just reliant on doing manual reviews of social media platforms and individually searching around the posts that are being put out on them. In this decide part of this decision loop, all of these decisions are being taken on very static information. So a snapshot in time when that analysis is produced and then action is taken and the observation of that action is very difficult. There is a, there's limited ability for, uh, individuals to monitor and evaluate the impact of their, of their disinformation interventions. So essentially all of this leads to a very slow analysis, which leads to delayed decision makings, which are flawed in the fact that they rely on a single snapshot in time, which may be a few days out of date. And there is limited ability to be able to pivot to uh, new approaches if your intervention does not have the desired effect. So before I jump into, um, what we've done, I think it's uh, very important to know that disinformation is an adversarial concept. Um, there are, uh, there's a constant, constant kind of competing tension between people who are trying to push out more disinformation and people who are trying to counter it. And AI has a role to play in both of these, unfortunately. So I'm going to pick off the dark side first before looking at the light side. The dark side of artificial intelligence is that it can help really land the messages that people are trying to get to the right target audiences. It helps target them, they help to facilitate the dissemination. In addition to that, it helps provide evidence or evidence as much as can be, um, can be considered. So AI generated fake content, which can help either support a narrative claim or be the fundamental basis of that disinformation narrative. Those are the dark sides. 
Um, the light side is where you see kind of this com combination of open source data and natural language processing techniques and machine learning algorithms, which can help speed up this decision-making process, can speed up the understanding of the, of a disinformation narrative at scale, rather than looking at post level and also help support on monitoring and evaluating the impact of, of these. So I mentioned the fact that I'm delivery lead for a counter disinformation platform for UK government. I'm just going to spend the next probably five minutes going through that in a little bit more detail. Um, we, the foundational of this platform is two parts of uh, data. So focus social media data and commercial data sets. By focus social media data, I mean data that has been collected from social media platforms, but is focused specifically on camp on disinformation narratives or um, or particular channels where disinformation is known to have spread. It's very important to ensure that we also have kind of a, a measured approach to, um, to looking at social media data, given the privacy concerns around it. These seven platforms, social media data is collected from these seven uh, platforms and ingested into this data platform. At that point, we embed them into a vector in space and we use a, um, a capability called semantic search to understand relevant posts, which are similar. So they're in a similarity radius to that, uh, those posts, and that returns those relevant posts in response to your search query. It's very similar to how kind of a Google search would work. Instead of writing in, in our keyword searches, you're able to type in a sentence and it'll pull back uh, results. This enables a much more precise and accurate, um, understanding of the of posts involved around disinformation narrative particularly removing any noise that you might see from Boolean or keyword analysis, and also includes other, um, other posts, which may not have the exact language, but may set, share similar language or similar context, which could be useful in seeing emerging narratives appearing at the edges of disinformation. Now there are uh, touching briefly on the methodology behind a threat assessor. There are two main elements. One is scale and one is severity. So scale is how how is your narrative resonating? Is it spreading far and wide? Um, is it receiving a lot of traction? And then severity looks at the nature of the language and nature of the narrative itself. Is it violent? Um, is it, is it hate speech involved in it? Is it being coordinated? The two of those together combine to give you a picture of how threatening a narrative is. So to cover up on the scale side very quickly, um, this platform and just the data can provide, uh, information on the scale of uh, disinformation of a narrative posting out. The particular search that I put in here is, uh, within the last 30 days, actually is, uh, the search I put in is the West is responsible for sabotaging Nord Stream. This platform has pulled back all posts related to this. You can see overview of the posts. You can see detailed post levels as well, but most interesting for an analyst here would be to look at those number of posts over time. And as you can see here, there's a spike on the 29th of September on Twitter which is uh, a couple of days after the Nord Stream attack. Jumping to a longer term view though, you can see a rise in posts actually on OKRU, a Russian social media platform, even in advance of, of this attack. So what we are starting to see is the seeding of a narrative in a Russian social media platform in advance of an attack. And this could be coordinated. It could be um, just some people starting to bounce ideas off each other. So it'd be very interesting to jump in to see that in a bit more detail. And this is where severity can start to help. So there are four main elements to severity. Um, one, which looks at calls to violence. Um, so are they particularly violent and asking people to go out and take up arms and acts? Another looking at hateful speech, um, which will then look at the nature of the language around um, a narrative and if it's targeting certain communities, certain audiences. And the final two elements, which are probably a little bit more interesting for this is around indicators of coordination. So is there a, are there signs of this being a coordinated attempt to, um, start to push a narrative and whether there are bots or suspicious accounts, inauthentic accounts that are being used to push this narrative. So if I was an analyst seeing that particular spike in posts in advance of the Nord Stream attack, I'd want to look in a little bit more detail around the indicators of coordination. And as you can see from the red bar charts here. This is showing that there have been a spike in identical posts being pushed out in advance of that, which leads me to consider this is likely a coordinated attack using exactly the same language to push out and to start to seed that idea of 
um, of this narrative. The second element I'd then jump into would be looking at bots. So the final uh, metric on here was around bot detection. And this looked at the similarity of the posts within a, an account itself. So the first indicative coordination is looking across the whole information in ecosystem. The second one is looking at within that account itself, how similar are the posts. And this is showing that there is a high likelihood of very similar posts within the accounts. So what we're looking at here is a coordinated attempt to seed a disinformation narrative around the West sabotaging the Nord Stream pipeline in advance of the attack by accounts which have been set up for the sole purpose of pushing out this narrative. So you can see this is a very coordinated attack. So take us back to Salisbury uh, and in 2018, how could this uh, platform have helped at that point? Now, between the attack on the 4th of March and the 6th of March, I mentioned this 48 hour window where nothing was really circulating from government. And this is where speculation, circulation, speculation begins to rise. Over a longer time period, over the 13 days, um, that's how long it took until there was a formal announcement that it was overwhelmingly likely that Russia and Putin himself was behind this attack. But the initial period, that 48 hour period, where you start to see these narratives circulating is the most dangerous period. And that's the period where this platform can really help to raise awareness of the narratives which are beginning to circulate, understand the most concerning ones, which are pushing out um, a certain position, potentially backed by hostile state actors which should be addressed by uh, the government or by other actors while the investigation work still continues. So to conclude, the combination of um, open source data from official APIs from commercial data sets can be pulled together in such a way that analysis, such as the one I showed through around uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, can be produced in a matter of minutes, whereas previously, currently, it takes uh, days to produce that analysis thus speeding up the ability to tackle disinformation narratives which are circulating and potentially have a harmful and lasting impact on the public before they start to spread to our left control. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I look forward to taking any questions in the Q&A. That's great, Mike. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's fascinating. Um, we are moving on to um, our last uh, speaker of the um, morning, afternoon in uh, the UK. Um, Eric Zapp of Public Democracy. Um, Eric uh, served as a pastor, a Senate committee staffer at the Pentagon in national politics, and for a decade he served as president of Public Democracy, a B corporation that uses digital business solutions for social impact. They focus on holes in the data and undervalued communities, allowing uh, public democracy to map out disinformation networks in a fascinating way. It has applied those insights and its empathy-based approach to MarTech data um, to uh, an eight-figure paid media campaign over the past 18 months to outcompete disinformation at a human and an algorithmic level. Eric, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, I am starting with this slide. We'll talk about a lot of numbers and data, but all of our work is empathy based. And I think whenever you're talking about behavioral data, people say, kind of, how do we achieve it? This is really the key. You have to move past the numbers and understand behind each of these numbers is a person. Um, I'm a Christian. When you give the adversarial side, you know, Jesus had things to say about loving your neighbor, but Ender Wiggins may have said it best to truly be able to beat your enemy. You have to understand them to a level where it's inevitable. And at some state, there will be love involved in your understanding. This, more than anything else, is the key to our um, our success and, and, and what we do. But we approach data. We, we repurpose MarTech, open source commercial data. We use three primary lenses. The lens of space, which is looking online at online environments, sites, et cetera. Audience groups of people. And we'll know our audiences are understood this will include geo. So physical space will create audiences of people and then content, which is keywords. This is how a lot of the commercial space is structured and how we engage information. And when you start layering them, you get additional insights. You layer people in space, you can find the audiences that are showing up in different sites. Look at different audiences based on their overlapping content. 
you can get greater refinement. And then when you look at the type of content, specific words and space, you can map out um, different network effects, a lot of which are discussed by our past panelists. You add on to that the time, fourth dimension, and you can see shifts behavior. We use this both to un great, gain better insights and to measure, measure impacts. If you're running an intervention, you can look at where people were before, where they moved to after. You can also look at how algorithmically keywords shift, how the internet starts to understand what these communities need and want more. Because we always have two audiences, we have a human and an algorithmic audience. We actually have implemented an AI diversity initiative on our team. Same way you understand people, you have to understand the math machines. By bringing machines and AI into our process and literally treating it like diversity, it gives us different perspectives. We will create titles. We will create ads with AI. See what it thinks is the best answer. And then that gives us better insights on uh, the, the problems and communities we're engaging. And a second point on this, everything in behavioral data is crowdsourced solutions. There's nothing that we ever, and I'll go get to case studies next. Everything we're describing, my team, our partners didn't find. There were tens of thousands of people who found those answers before us. We only find it because someone found it earlier and increasingly a machine understood that well enough to start connecting those uh, people. So I'll run through a couple of case studies of how we got into disinformation where B Corp, kind of a 501c3 affiliates, um, our work had been working in undervalued, um, unseen communities, finding holes in data, working on economic inclusion, health equity. We started, um, uh, well, actually started working with, with, with veterans that led us into opioids where we were looking at these behavioral data, looking at changes in behavior, looking at questions people asked and associated keywords. And we were just in this open source data, same as Venice, Samuel and Mike as have described. We're able to identify and look back in time at what led people to these points. We were able to work with the Haidas, uh, the drug interdiction groups in Baltimore and DC to the emphasize how important the paycheck pay cycle was in predicting whether demand was going to be for treatment or overdose, completely changed how they were doing interventions on, on opioids. Another point that is a good one for all of us that I'm increasingly leaning in on, we were able to work with these cities and find their highest drug sale and overdose points because the way their data, when everyone talks about big data, we always spoke to, oh, you, you got to get it all unified. There's all the problem of cleaning the data. Well, they had a ton of streets, it would be an intersection, and the report would be on one street or one set or the other. We didn't clean it all. We just mapped it all. And when you mapped it, by not trying to unify it and adding a visual overlay, and allowed for a fixing of a lot of their data. And finally, by looking at just the commercial tools, where, where else might we advertise to find this audience that we've identified? We were able to identify Adderall as a precursor risk for opioid addiction. It had been showing up in the criminal side. Everyone had thought it was a party mix. And we started seeing increasingly as, as a predictor, hey, you want to get people to come into your audience. They all care about Adderall. Um, when we brought that to the scientists, they did a, this, it triggers the exact same part of the brain as an opioid. That's the equivalent of a hug. 10% of American kids are on Adderall. It makes them much more susceptible. We were doing this as COVID broke out, applied these same sort of tools, just looking at open source commercial data on where changes in this particular words, words around search and words around content that different anonymized audiences were engaging. You know, we all have Gmail free for a reason. We're using words with friends or Call of Duty. Every word you use is tagged and put in these anonymized commercial segments. It allowed us in March of 2020 to identify all of the major outbreaks in America in the middle of the month before the first test came back. 
also to be able to identify loss of smell as a precursor for COVID. We didn't find that. We just looked at these outliers in the data and found the people who were already finding those things. And again, early 2020, you had certain communities that were dialed in on loss of smell, on shortness of breath, on all these things we now know are associated with COVID before those were um, publicly, uh, as publicly known. This brought us into clinical trials and I list this one in particular because it goes back to the importance of understanding people. We were able to um, work with communities in New Orleans and Baton Rouge to complete some of the first fully inclusive clinical trials. Everyone said this was impossible. Those people never showed up. Those people, Black, Hispanic, were seen below poverty. All the data was, it was a problem. Like, this is a problem. They oh, single moms, it's a problem. We looked at who those people were, and one of the big keys was single moms. They're always the top guaranteed resource consumers. Wherever they are, they will outcompete everybody else for parent resources. And those single moms were never participating because they get a mailer three months in advance saying, hey, you can sign up for the clinical trial. That wasn't an equal chance. It was an absolute barrier to their participation. When we met that single mom at 1130 at night, right before the test, where she was looking for how do we help my kids keep up when they're in daycare all day, how to keep my family safe when I'm a front end worker. And the reality was she wasn't getting a lot of good answers and choices. When she got the opportunity, hey, do you want to find out if you had COVID? If you, if you have COVID, it's free. You can schedule it whenever you want. You can reschedule because life happens. They jumped at it. And so again, when you understand these differences, it starts to create opportunities to outcompete. With all of that, working in these vulnerable areas, we also have done some work in the anti-trafficking. I will just say a big amen to everything Samuel does. And uh, that's very important work. You start to see patterns and you see groups doing things that are not natural. That's what we started to see with some of those past cases. And we started to dig using many of the same tools that have already been identified and increasingly started to see a very intentional network of disinformation sources. Again, tied to trafficking, tied to porn, uh, tied with malware, looking at backlinks, language tells, et cetera, that we started to put together. Once we'd identified this intentional network of sources that were sharing and spreading disinformation, we were able at the bottom to get build audiences of the Americans who were engaged with that content. And our approach has never been, we don't want to admire the problem. Again, nonprofit, B Corp, we wanted to outcompete it. And so we set out with our network of other nonprofit civil society. My single answer would be, we want to beat disinformation, got to understand it. And then we just got to do a better job. Because the reality is the Russians understand a lot of our communities better than civil society and even some of the groups that purport to serve them. They don't care about what those people should ask what they shouldn't know. They just try to answer questions and lead them down dark and dangerous places. We need to provide better answers. We've worked with these nonprofits, over 60 around the country, uh, again, eight-figure campaign targeting these audiences with better answers and information. And we measured then the, the impacts of, of all of these different engagements. We looked at a 22 million person segment that was getting 90% of all their health and news information out of that disinformation network. We had over a billion ads into that group over six months and continued to use these exact same tools, looking at asking the system, hey, where could I show uh, uh, an ad, an impression? How many unique people can I show it to? These are foundational metrics in commercial advertising. And I love, can I show it to them in my disinformation network? Can I show it to them on other news and health sites and measure a movement of uh, almost 60% in how much they were consuming? 20% of that group 
we can no longer find on the disinformation network after this six month period. We also used similar to, to Mike, but we, we, we went into the engagement side of social media. So not looking at did they post, but are people engaging content? We would, Harvard and MIT have developed some really good theories on nudge theory that say the more you engage and ask people, could you spot disinformation, the less likely they are to share. We also measure that by measuring, um, again, the, the engagement rates and shifts over time. We worked right in one of the major defenses of the January 6th committee. And our task was only speak to people in Fox primetime and in this disinformation audience. And this is the case study that goes back to my very first slide. No people understand them. No one is the enemy. Almost every wicked disinformation has been tricked into that space. Some of them do awful things because of it. But they all deserve a chance. And on January 6th, committee work into these communities, we saw an old overwhelming response. People jumping at incredible rates, massive interactions. And these are folks that are at Breitbart, Info, Epic Times. Again, they're watching Tucker Carlson and then they're coming to this site. And one of the keys is we never told people what they needed to believe about January 6th. We just provided information to find out for yourselves is a key to this success. And people kept digging and digging and digging. We also were doing work promoting um, successes in Ukraine. And the other side of doing this is you start to get these competitor analyses. All of a sudden, in August, we were running positive news about Ukraine. There was a huge demand that was the aggregators on news were not doing a good job meeting. This was a great outcompete in disinformation because people wanted it. And suddenly we saw this massive buy from the Cato Institute pop up as a major competitor of ours because we on these audiences. We look at where it's going. It's going to destination pages that are talking about the Ukrainians as, as um, Nazis, are talking about how the U.S. just needs to make peace. Doubled Cato's ad traffic. They hadn't done buys all year. It all happened in August. These are the sort of questions that get one to start digging. As we're into these groups in the military and folks that are here about those issues, we see other competitors. We see groups that look like on their surface completely Christian groups that are targeting business and other information that when you look at who they're engaging, though, it's all military people. You look at the keywords that are ranking on those networks of sites. To the user, it looks like, hey, I'm getting business information. I'm getting Bible studies. I'm finding out about general pieces. Oh, hey, there's something about the military. I'm in that too. Bull. They head into a very clear funnel that is radicalizing. You can see on the left here the keywords that those groups are winning. And this is again how you out compete. When you see where they're winning, spaces they shouldn't be. We just run through our network of nonprofits, better answers at those spaces. And you can measure again a reduction in algorithmic ranking over time that affects um, traffic. Last exact tie to that, you're into these audiences and you start seeing. Other advertisers on business, Mike Flynn and Clay Clark with their Thrive site, targeting veterans moving into business spaces on military.com and other sites. This takes them into on the surface, simple, hey, how to be, here's resources to start your business. These are vets and new military trying to make it. All you got to do is enter your information where you're immediately put into segments to be remarketed. And if you enter your information, and start to sign up for the conferences, this is where you end up. You end up on the great reawakening. You can get a sense from the pictures of what the focus is. And you start joining people that are being funneled into this from all over. The other people on those sites are from, you know, anti-masking. They are mirroring Time to Free America, other sites that go all to the same space. And these are how these networks work. The way we beat them is to outcompete. Awesome, Eric. Wow. And thank you very much for that. A really uh, compelling uh, story. 
Um, for all of the panelists, thank you all. I mean, I know that um, this is uh, extra to all of the duties you all have at your day job. So thank you for taking several hours out of your day today and then the time you took to prepare just these excellent presentations that demonstrate such richness and variety in the way that each of you are addressing your problem set. So just honored to have heard it all and um, look forward to continuing engagement with all of you. That's it. Thank you, Kristen and Maria, and thanks to all of our panelists. A great session. Look, I'll just to quickly recap, you know, just uh, I'll, I'll go back to what uh, Varun uh, commented right up front that, uh, you know, uh, this capability enables illicit activity embedded in licit activity uh, to be uncovered. And I, I'd substitute the word illicit with any activity. So any re intelligence requirement uh, that you can identify you know, somewhere is embedded in open source or commercially available information. Incredibly powered set of resources and, and capabilities, which I, I just, I love the, the breadth of issues discussed here today and, and the examples, you know, from national defense to health, to disinformation, uh, to human trafficking, uh, to markets and what markets mean, how analyzing that, how that uh, uh, helps assess, um, uh, uh, state of nations and not just markets. So an incredible piece on display just here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So strikes me, secrets are no longer the key to Intel. If you can collect it, you can analyze it, you can purpose it, applying tools. Uh, this poses an incredible challenge for the intelligence community because it no longer has a monopoly either on collection or analysis. And in fact, um, I think in many respects, it's probably behind the power curve on that. The competitive advantage is shifting in this, and it's important that we think about how it gets involved in all of our outside government institutions, but also how this can be purposed within government and be more effective, more open, more useful. So with that, I want to thank everybody for participating. Loved this. Look forward to follow up in the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.